my first Christian experience was in the Baptist faith. And I cannot recall in the two, three years that I was a member of the little Baptist church in the community, I cannot recall any sermons or messages or discussion among the members of the sanctuary message. As a matter of fact, if you reach out into the Christian community, wherever out there, I don't think you will hear about the sanctuary message or sanctuary truth or the message contained in the sanctuary of the Old Testament. I don't think you'll find anyone who really bothers, who really spends the time and bother to understand what it's all about. More than that, more than this, I found that when I began to think along Adventist lines, read Adventist books, read, think, hear, I thought, well, this is the sanctuary message. And with Adventists, that had to do with 1844. Am I ringing any bells? Am I whatever? And what did Adventists conclude was going to take place in 1844? Come on. Now this is, this is close to the heart, the pillar of Adventism truth, what we believe is, was present truth at that time. And what did the Advent believers believe? Jesus was coming. That Jesus was coming even to the day. Tell me what day. October 22 of what year? 1844. When Jesus didn't appear, didn't come, and the world didn't end, um, what happened to the sanctuary message? Come on, how did Adventist deal handle with it? Yes. Sacred place. <laughs> God did probation. We, we did the logical, reasonable thing. We said it was the time was correct. That's what we, that's what we reasoned. The time was correct. But God saw fit to give us a tarrying time. How long have we been tarrying? <laughs> Too long. Now, it's not my purpose here this morning to discuss October 22 of 1844. I want to talk about the sanctuary message. Because it has been an ongoing study at the personal level for me for many years now. Jesus did not come in 1844. I want to entitle our study here this morning in the sanctuary, Where is the Promise? And uh, God immediately began promising, promising, promising in the garden. Did he make promises before they sinned or after they sinned? No, no, no. After they sinned. Everything was okay before. God didn't need to promise anything. They had it. The garden was air conditioned, guys. Did he already make a decision that if man sinned, that's what he's going to Yes, but that's sa the sanctuary message is Genesis 3.15. I am going to make a way for you. Now, the sanctuary message had to do with the Holy Spirit leaving Adam and Eve. I get the idea, and it's, it's just an idea. I get the idea that the Holy Spirit, the light, the covering of the Holy Spirit, the dwelling and dwelling of the Holy Spirit, did not leave them instantly. In other words, they were not one moment standing there and the next moment they were buck naked. It, it appears to me in reading and reasoning that the light began to diminish, began to leave them. Now, tell me what the light was. Come on, what, what light? was within them and without them. What was it? The light of what? 
The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. We were made to be indwelled by the Spirit. Which Spirit? The Spirit of God. How was that pictured in Genesis? How is that pictured? You and I are made of dirt. That's what it says. You and I are dirt until something happened to change our condition. And what was that? So let's get the picture. We, we want to make this as simple as we can, but as meaningful as possible. When it comes to a body, God was hands-on. The Lord God took and formed man of the dust of the ground. You always knew you were dirt. <laughs> It's the work of preachers to make sure you know. It was hands-on. But it was just, it was a corpse. It was, a, it was just mud, dirt, dust, shaped, but it was not alive. So when man was to be made alive, it was not a hands-on it was so God kissed us to life have you ever heard of the kiss of death Genesis is about the kiss of life and man became it says man became what did he become he was mud and now something is added, and what did he become? What did the added? A living soul. He became a soul. That's body and breath. Now that breath in the Hebrew back there is the same as spirit. Not everyone is aware of that. But God breathed the spirit of life into Adam. Now, what happened as soon as Eve and then Adam chose to disobey the express will and command of God? Tell me what happened. What was the first thing that became evident? When Jesus arrived in the garden, when the angel of the Lord arrived in the garden, he said, Adam, where are you? Uh, did the Lord not know where Adam was? Where are you? Um, I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? I don't have any clothes on. What clothes? Come on. They were clothed with what? With light. The presence of God was indwelling them and outer dwelling them. They were clothed. Who told you you were naked? What have you done? Now this is the next thing that sin brings on. It's instant and it's with us to this day. What have you done? The woman did it. Right? Come on. What did you do, woman? Oh, the serpent did it. And so today, even the insurance companies will tell you it's an act of God. Katrina is an act of God. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that every bad thing that happens is an act of God? That's what the church believed when Jesus was here. Who sinned? This man or his parents? You, know, you can't have trouble unless... You did something. And all that was necessary for you or me or anyone else to do was be born. That's all that was necessary. Now God set something into motion before he put them out of the garden. And I want to suggest to you, no, I'm going to go beyond a suggestion. I want to say to you that what God set into motion we refer to as the plan of salvation. 
or the sanctuary message. The plan of salvation. How can I say this, that you will get it and never forget it? So here goes. Most of you know I like to garden. I love to garden. I love to see things grow. And you also know that I hate weeds. I despise weeds. Now this is what I have learned in the garden. That's where they were. This is what I have learned in the garden. That if I sow good seed and I get up the next morning to go see if it sprouted yet, it hasn't sprouted. So I come back in the afternoon to see if it sprouted yet. It hasn't sprouted. So I get up the next morning and I go to see. Has anything sprouted? Nothing. And I do this until I see the first little, it may take a few days, right? For what to appear? The good seed to make an appearance. How quickly do the bad things appear? It doesn't seem like it is overnight. So here is the lesson of the garden. Good takes a lot of time to produce fruit. Bad produces instant fruit. I'm looking at you. Did you get it? Do I need to say it again? How long did it take from the time Adam and Eve chose to do wrong until... Now God sowed some good seed to start a whole new plan. That good seed was a promise. A promise. How long is it taking for this good seed to bear fruit? Don't say the cross. Don't say, no, no, no. What is the good seed? What is the promise? The promise is that I am going to restore you to mint condition. I, I'm, I'm going to bring you back. I like the way Ellen White says it. To restore in man the image of God. Did we once own that? Yes, yes we did. Sin has separated between you and your God, it says. And I've hidden my face from you. Now, what I'm asking you and me to understand before we go forward with this is that the good seed God sowed after sin is called a promise. That's what that I, I sow good seed and I'm looking, I'm expecting, I'm hoping, I'm praying, I'm wishing, I'm, I'm all of those things, but it takes several days. At last, something has sprouted. Something is happening. How long do I have to wait for good fruit? Right? The lesson of the garden is this. God entered into the promise business. The promise. Let's back up just one slide and see if that's the way it works. This is Exodus chapter 3. I have said, who is the I? Come on. I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Now we refer to this as the Exodus. Who made the promise? God's in the promising business. I know you've taken note of that, but just to be sure, of what did God say to Abram? How much of this land will be yours? Come on. And you can see. God is in the promising business. That's very difficult for you and me to handle. 
Why? Because we live, you and I as human beings live such a short time and the weeds are everywhere. And then some angels showed up on the scene and said, let's go pull the weeds up. And God said, what? Jesus said, what? No, 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 leave them alone. And that does not make for happy campers. You and I are waiting for something to happen. So let's get into the sanctuary. Let's... Back there in the garden, the presence, the fullness, the indwellingness of the Holy Spirit was lost. Now we believe that some measure of the Spirit, some little measure, small measure of the Spirit was not completely taken away from us. I think the verse says there's a light that lights every man. But it's just a glimmer. It's just, it's just a little flicker. The Holy Spirit was lost. Now just before Jesus appears in the sky, just before he comes, what happens to the saints down here who are reckoned and accorded to be saints? What is going to happen before Jesus gets too near. Come on. Changed. Changed. For we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And what is the change? Glory to glory. This was glory. This is glory. Now we believe, you and I believe, that it's been at least 6,000 years from the garden. At least. That's a long time. In human terms, that's a long time. And how many generations have come and gone posing the question, where is the promise of His coming, His kingdom, His spirit? Where is the promise? Waiting, 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 waiting. And it's the human condition that makes us impatient in all of this. Does God know that you and I, in our condition, would exhibit impatience? Does God know that? So God asks something of you and me to do something, to manifest or exhibit something until he gets this thing turned around. Wait and watch. It's a single word. It's called faith. And in Spanish, the word for faith is to wait. That's what we're doing. We're waiting. What are we waiting for? Streets of gold? No. What are we waiting for? Gates of pearl? No. Would I like to have streets paved with gold? Yes, 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 I would, yes to all of that. But what are we waiting for? No one, you know what Revelation 6 says in this regard? It says the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man ran and they ducked into what? Caves, rocks, whatever they could find. And why were they crying out for the rocks to hide them? Hide us from what? The face of him that comes. The Holy Spirit has to be measured in fullness to you and me at the end before Jesus comes too near. And by the way, Old Testament prophets say that even the righteous cry out. See? So you and I, once upon a time, had the promise of the fullness of God, God's Spirit. That was lost. 
But what God is promising to do in the sanctuary, in the sanctuary, in the sanctuary time, what God is promising to do is to bring us back to the original plan. I know that makes sense to you. I hope it makes sense. Now we're going to be focusing over here. But right now we're going to focus over here. There were 4,000 years of promises. There are 4,000 years of promises. Where's the promise of his coming? Where is he? Where is the king that we're all waiting for and praying for? 4,000 years of promises. That's a long time. We're still waiting on the same promises that Abram and Isaac and Jacob and A and 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 you and I are still waiting for these promises to be met. From the garden to the cross, there was no saved human being. What do we mean by saved? Forgiven would be one word. Forgiven. Why not? In the Old Testament, God promises to forgive us our sins. Not until Jesus came and died could he say with authority, so that you may know that the Son of Man has power or authority on earth to forgive sins. I say, not until Jesus came and paid the blood price could any man be saved? We call this the Old Covenant. Let's, let's, let's do this. The Old Covenant. You can call it Old Testament. From here to here, no man was saved or could be saved. A blood price. Had to be paid. If the blood price had not been paid with divine blood, with righteous blood, with spotless blood, if, the, if that price had not been paid, we would still be laboring under, suffering under, except I think the day of wrath would have come. If Jesus had failed in his mission, I don't think you and I would be a reality today. That's just an observation. So we can refer to this as the old covenant. That somehow sounds negative. It sounds... No, there was nothing wrong with the original plan. What went wrong and who went wrong? What went wrong was the devil showed up. And who went wrong was Adam and Eve. And you and I were in their genes. So we have inherited sinfulness. Now, this is why, when you come over here, let's get, get this a little more pronounced. When you come over here to the New Testament, Paul is going to write a new story. Paul, he's the major writer of the New Testament. Okay? Not the only one, of course. But he says in Ephesians, for example, in Ephesians 1, through his blood, or in his blood, we have forgiveness of sin. Now this gets interesting because most Christians believe that when God forgave us our sins, when we pray and ask for forgiveness and God says, I forgive you, that that is salvation. That is not salvation. I can be forgiven. 
I am forgiven, but there's something yet to be accomplished. So let's go on with this, get a little deeper into this. No saved man until the blood price is paid. Now we begin a whole new series, a whole new course of promises. Uh, did John the Baptist believe that the kingdom was coming in his day? That, that was the burden of his message, his preaching. Kingdom of heaven is what? It's here. When Jesus sent his disciples out, what was their message? The kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. When Jesus is going to be leaving here and going back up there, he says to the disciples, you go out and you tell everyone. But in Acts 1 and 2, after his resurrection and showing himself to his disciples again, they said, is this the time? Within days of his resurrection, and their question was a valid question. It was not out of place. Is this the time for you to restore the kingdom? Now Jesus' answer was classic. It's not for you to what? So Whatever this means and whatever this means, we can see that God has been very actively hiding the date. <coughs> Let's reason that one out. Why would God hide something as important and as worthy as the first coming of Jesus? Tell me how many people on planet Earth knew about his first coming. A few shepherds out in the field. Some foreigners over yonder. Why would God be actively hiding, disguising the time? I can't. I can't. 35 plus years ago, I was traveling nonstop. I spoke to thousands. I believed with everything in me that the end was at hand. Now 35, almost 40 years have come and gone. And a lot of those people that heard that message have come and gone. Now, can that be discouraging? If you didn't have some witnesses who went through this trial, this testing before us, John the Baptist, you know where he finally came to? He sent word for his disciples to come and through the bars, he said, go find him, go find him and ask him, are you the one or are we looking for somebody else? What answer did Jesus send? He simply said, go and tell John what you see. That's all. God has been at work hiding I, I hesitate to use the word disguising, but God has been actively hiding the time that is going to be required for this plan to bear fruit. Tell me what the fruit of the plan is. To restore in man what? The image of God. That means if you had the image of God here with the Holy Spirit in fullness and you're going to have the Holy Spirit measured in fullness again, 
Could this be the time and the place that Jesus was uh, referring to when he said, some 30-fold, some 40-fold, some 50-fold, some 60-fold, some what? 100-fold. Oh, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Let's, let's add something else. There were certain benefits that were purchased when Jesus died. They were not purchased until he died. The blood had to be shed. Now what are the benefits of the shed blood? Watch this. Extended time. Ooh. I don't know whether I should be happy about that or not. <laughs> Extended time. What am I referring to? In Revelation 6, Jesus is coming. And everybody is saying, fall on us rocks, fall on us mountains, hide us from his feet, hide us from what? Hide us from his face, because the great day of his what is come. See, the first time he came, it was all disguised as humanity. He took the everyday covering of man. When he comes the next time, if you want to read the description in simple terms, get it in Revelation chapter 10. John said, I saw him. His face was on fire. Even his hands and his feet were on fire. Now that fire, if a person is not covered by grace, not covered by the forgiveness, not covered by the blood of Christ, that person is going to what? It says in Revelation 18, 19, slain by the brightness of his coming. So you and I cannot endure the fullness of his presence. And that's what's coming here. When Jesus returns, it will be the fullness of his presence. Nothing between. Well, benefit of grace, extended time. I have put here, not yet wrath time. Not yet. So I, I really give thanks, and I think you should too, that we have extended time because if he hadn't had, if God hadn't extended extra time to us, you wouldn't have come along and I wouldn't have come along. And some folks that I'm not real fond of wouldn't have come along. So extended time is extended grace. Let's go on. Now it is possible for a legal, lawful forgiveness of sin. Because what price has been paid? Come on, a blood price, but what we would call that, how about a redemption price? God is beginning to lay claim here to you and me. Not just the territory. He's going to get the territory back. The Bible's full of that. But he doesn't care about the territory. What does he care about? And so he is beginning the process of forgiveness. When, when, we, when the evangelist or the preacher says, uh, if you've never given your heart to the Lord, if you've never surrendered to Christ, if you have, if you have not, if you have, whatever, you need to be forgiven. So you need to confess your sins. And if you do confess your sins, what is the promise? Come on. He is faithful and just to do what? To forgive us. Do we need that peace of mind and heart down here? Yes, we do. We need that. So there is a legal paid blood price, lawful forgiveness. 
And this is where much of Christianity, I think, falls short. We're not accusing, we're just observing. I meet Christians all the time, various denominations, who believe that when you confess that God forgives you and that is salvation. The Bible doesn't agree with that. Salvation is what happens when Jesus comes. We're out of here. Amen. The promise helps us hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. My little grandmother, um, when she was in her late 40s, she began to lose her eyesight, detached retinas. She began to lose her hearing. And back those years ago, a hearing aid was not much of aid, you know. She had a little box right here and she would sit at the dinner table and she would crank, 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 crank. And of course I was not part of the, you know, those of us sitting around the table would just drop our voices and drop our voices and drop. She thought, well, And then granddaddy would take a fork and hit the plate, bang. She had to have aid to hear. Now I have pictures, I have mental images of my grandmother in her mid to late 50s, 50s. I have images of my grandmother coming in from church on Sabbath and going into the room, into the house and sitting by the window, right there at the window so she could get all the daylight possible and holding the Bible this close. And would you call her a saint? She was a saint. She loved God. She loved God's word. She wanted any little bit she could get. Here, here, anywhere. My grandfather was not a converted person. She would get up on Sabbath morning and say, Jack, I need 25 cents for car fare. And Jack would say hateful things and so you want to go over there with those Seventh-day Adders. You walk. And she would walk three miles to church. Because her husband wouldn't even give her 25 cents. You understand what I'm saying? Now, I need to hear from God. I need to hear in my heart, in my mind, in the depths of my soul, I forgive you. I need to hear that. Because in the depths of my soul, what do I know? I'm guilty. And I want forgiveness. But forgiveness is not salvation. Forgiveness is necessary. It's on the road to salvation. Salvation is when he shows up in the clouds of heaven and shouts. That's salvation. And that's Bible, by the way. Extended time, legal, lawful forgiveness. And we're going to see what this means prophetically, by and by. It was now possible, not here, here, it became possible for a person to enter into the throne room by faith and pray directly to God. Did Jesus back that up? Did Jesus back that up? He said, listen, you're a needy person. You don't have what you need. And the reason you don't have what you need is because you what? You didn't ask. So it is now possible this side of the cross 
for a sinner, you, me, us, all of us, all people on this rock, it is now possible for me to go directly in by faith into the presence of God with my prayers, with my supplications. Do I always know what to say? Does God add anything to your prayers and mine? What does he add? A measure of what? We don't know how to pray as we need. God adds to it, it says. This is grace time. Direct prayers. Back here, it was necessary for a lamb to be offered. You want to get near to God? You want to ask something of God? You've got to bring a substitute. You have to bring a blood substitute. And human priests were sanctified by God to stand and mediate between the sinner and God. Now the Catholic Church has never gotten over that. This is what troubled Martin Luther and made a Protestant out of him. What did he discover? What did he discover? Come on. And when and where did he discover it? On his knees. Climbing the steps. I've been to those steps. J. Reynolds Hoffman took me to Europe to show me some of these things. Share some of these things with me. I, got, I had a, a, a mental image. I had a picture of, well, I'm going to get there and find those steps, and I'm going to climb those steps too. <laughs> Forget it. They were wall to wall. People standing in a line that went out and out and out and down the block waiting to get on their knees and say a Hail Mary and go one step and say a Hail Mary and go a step and say, you understand? I don't fault them for that. But that's not good Bible. And Martin Luther was halfway up those steps and light from heaven flooded his thoughts. Tell me what he heard. The just shall live by what? Faith. Yes. That's faith. Faith. Direct prayer is now possible. Now I know none of you are sinners. I know that. I like you. Because I know you're saints. But if you were a sinner, you would think I cannot even pray because I'm a sinner. And what grace wants you and me and human beings to know is that God knows you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. And he wants us to ask for forgiveness. And he promises, did you, have you read Jesus? All, A-L-L, -L, all sins that men have committed shall be forgiven them. Even if they blaspheme against the Father. Even if they blaspheme against the Son. But there is one sin which cannot be forgiven. Which one is that? Come on. The sin against the Holy Ghost. Well, why? what makes that sin different than the others? Because if you drive the Holy Spirit away, you have nothing left to draw you to God. Amen. To bring repentance. You have nothing left. You have driven away your last hope. This is an enlargement here. No more sacrifices needed. No more human priests necessary. Some years ago, too many... I worked in a very large bank in Mobile, Alabama. Now I insert Mobile, Alabama because that's down on the coast and the coast was early settled by the Spaniards and the French and 
all of whom were Roman Catholic. So the influence of Catholicism is very real along the coast from New Orleans to Mobile to you name it, okay? Yeah. I worked in a very special arrangement in the bank and uh, several million dollars, one to five million dollars worth of cash and, and check transaction would cross my desk every day. And from time to time, I would see a, a, a check that stood out. Why did it stand out? Well, it was for 2,000 and it was for 3,000 and it was for 5,000 and most of these were 20, 30 dollar checks, okay? So you couldn't help but see it. And then down here, there would be a notation about what this money was for. Prayers for the soul of. Made payable to. You listening? Were millions of people taught that you could buy forgiveness? They still are. Were millions of people, and do millions of people continue to believe that you cannot pray directly to God? You have to come to the confessional. You have to come to the priest. The priest has to pray for you. Now, if, you, if you're really in tune here, you understand this is the difference between Protestantism and Catholicism. Catholicism says, you're a sinner. Protestantism says, you're a sinner. Catholicism says, you have to pay to get out of it. Protestantism says, somebody has already paid the price One view says uh, that sin is, uh, you've got to say 10 more Hail Marys for that sin. That was a bad one. One view says that what you do saves you. The other view says all I can do is ask in the name of Jesus for forgiveness. And when he comes, salvation. See, the plan of salvation, folk, is not done. It's not finished. Millions of people believe everything was finished at the cross. No, something new was begun. Everything will be finished because God never fails in His Word or His promises. Everything will be filled full. But only God knows that day and that hour. Until then, we must live and act in faith. Not easily done. Since the cross, the return of the Holy Spirit in measure by measure has become our reality. Now, how can we know that? Well, Jesus said things like this in John 16, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. He said things like, it's absolutely necessary, it's expedient for you that I go to my Father. If I don't go to my Father, who will not come? Ooh, how do you work that one out? So here's Jesus. He's in the flesh. How much of the Holy Spirit indwelled him while he was in the flesh? Come on, there's good Bible right here. To him was the Spirit given without, without measure. 
he was indwelled by what percentage of the Holy Spirit? 100%. Did the indwelling of the Holy Spirit aid him in his fight or struggle against temptation and sin? Let's have an example. He came up out of the water. Did he need to be baptized? No. Was he baptized for his own sins? No. He was baptized for us. Most of whom on this rock have never been baptized. So, he comes out of the water and straight away it says, and straightway the Spirit drave him, drove him, urged him into the wilderness there to be what? Have you, have you ever tried to get those verses together? I mean, God tempts no man and here it is, the Holy Spirit driving Jesus to be tempted. So Jesus goes into the wilderness. Was there a battle taking place out there? The answer, of course, is yes. But what was the battle? The temptation was there. It was full. It was present. The temptation or temptations were there. And who or what enabled him to obtain the victory? Come on. It was the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit brought what to his mind? Scripture. Scripture. And he said, it is written. This is, I mean, this is a, a tremendous eye-opener. If, if you just think of, about what's going on here. So Jesus had to be indwelled by the Holy Spirit. He had to be. You don't go out and meet the devil without some power. And what power did he have? The power of the Word. The power of God's promise. So he met the devil in whose strength? In the strength of his Father and the Holy Spirit. Now, how long did Jesus indwell? How long did the Holy Spirit indwell Jesus while he was here? Until some time, until something. How long was the Spirit indwelling him? Until he is hanging up there, suspended between heaven and hell, the grave. Until he is suspended up there, and he has to die, not simply the first flesh death, he has to die the real death, which is the second death. That's the curse that is waiting for you and me. Not just the fleshly death. That one Jesus says, just sleep. You can wake up from that one. But the second death, you don't come back. So Jesus prayed and made these words to his Father. Into your keeping, your hands, into your authority, I surrender my spirit. Now did you hear Jesus talk? It is expedient for you that I go to the Father, that I return. If I don't, the Holy Spirit will not come unto you. So let's work this out. Where did the Holy Spirit go? When Jesus said, I surrender my spirit, I give it to you. I entrust it to you. The one that came from. The spirit returns to God who gave it, yes. The high priest, that's what Jesus became when he went back. The high priest is there to seek the favor of heaven, God in this case. And I will pray the Father and he will give you
What did Jesus mean when he said, you have not because you ask not. But I'm going to tell you this about my Father. He is more willing to give the Holy Spirit. Who is going to give the Holy Spirit? He is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to them that ask than earthly parents are willing to give good gifts to their children. So Jesus recognizes that there is an authority over the spending of the Holy Spirit that belongs to the Father. When did it belong in toto and fullness to the Father? When Jesus hanging there said, into your hands I command what? So Let's try and sort this out. Does Jesus uh, lack the Holy Spirit today? I mean, uh, is, is, is he without the Spirit today? Or is he, did he surrender the authority to give the Holy Spirit, to spend the Holy Spirit? Did he surrender that authority to his Father until such time as... And the answer is yes. This transaction that we call the sanctuary plan of salvation, this transaction is still going on. Sometimes when I'm crossing the channels and I'm into the religious territory, sometimes you will hear people singing, Christians singing or praying. We thank you, O oh God, that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Is he yet king of kings and lord of lords? The answer is no. Revelation tells you no. Is there a moment in sanctuary time when he will become king of kings and lord of lords? See, that's what, the, that's what Pilate asked him. They say you're a king. Are you a king? Not yet. If I were, then would my servants... So Revelation 19 gives us the picture, answers the puzzle. He's coming. He's leading the armies of heaven to do what? To make war. And he has written on him, written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So who's waiting for these promises to be met? You, me, and who else? Jesus. Jesus. God is not asking anything of you and me that he is not the return of the Holy Spirit by measure. Now, as we go on in the day, We're going to come to the time of the end. Now, if you've been with us before, I have confessed and I continue to confess to you, I believe that's seven last years. Sanctuary time. Seven last years. When the time of the end comes, there is a moment, there is a moment, three and a half years, 1260 days, 42 months, in the which God is going to pour out an added measure of the Holy Spirit. What do we call that added measure? The latter rain. The latter rain. Absolutely. And uh, He's got angels all lined up with a checklist that says, uh, don't give him any because he smokes. Um, don't give them any because they belong to the wrong church. Don't give her any because he will pour out his spirit on flesh. How about all Catholics? <laughs> How about all Protestants? How about all Chinese? Are you listening? Are you, are, you, are you ready for this? How about all Muslims? Ooh. Are you listening? What does the scripture say about God being a respecter of persons? It's 
See, heaven can handle it. It's closed-minded, hard-headed, hard-hearted human beings who can't. Let that sheet down. Peter, kill and eat. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. Never have, never will. Let the sheet down again, boys. <coughs> Peter, kill and eat. No, no, no. I've never, and I will never. Let the sheet down one more time, boys. And when the sheet came down this time, the command was, Call no man common or unclean. See, that did not occur this side of the blood price. The Holy Spirit was not poured out. This is where Peter was living. Never. There is a change. Tell me what the change is. The blood price has been paid. And sinners can get in. Well, not if they commit a sin. Who said? See, when you get to this point in the discussion, there are always those who say you're, you're preaching cheap grace now. I want to tell you something, folks. Grace is not cheap. It costs the blood of God. It's not cheap. It's not free. You've heard the saying, There's, there are no free lunches. There's no such thing as free. Everything costs somebody something. And if God wants you and me to live in His house with Him forever, He's got to pay a price. And He's still paying that price, by the way. He's still paying. Until we get here. Now, this is purely my view. In the final three and a half years, right here, three and a half years, God is going to be measuring in added measure. God is going to be adding His Spirit to this equation, this time equation. At the beginning of this three and a half years, I do not believe 100% of the Holy Spirit will be poured out. Not at the beginning. Now God is going to send two witnesses, and we'll see this a little later in a study in the day. God is going to send two witnesses to explain to the whole world, to every kindred tongue, nation, and people, it says. My two witnesses I'm going to send. Those two witnesses, according to Scripture, not according to Brother Wheeling, according to Scripture, are Moses and Elijah. Moses is the one God chose to give the law, make the law known. Elijah is the one God chose to say, you have to measure up. You can't just say, you can't, you have to keep the law because time is closing. The doors are closing. The sanctuary is about to be emptied. That's what the time of the end is all about. The time of the end of what? The end of grace. The end of the plan. And so God is going to measure His Spirit. Not everyone is going to respond to that spirit. Some are going to respond 30-fold. Some are going to respond 60-fold or 50-fold or 40-fold. Some are going to respond what? 100-fold. 
If you've ever wondered about the 144,000, there's no mention of the 144,000 all the way back for 6,000 years. The only time they're mentioned, the only time they're brought to view is in the book of Revelation. While the sanctuary is in business in heaven. We call that the judgment. Now why is it necessary for Moses to come? And what is going to be the consequence or result? What will be the fruitage of Moses coming along? Because the world is going to be brought face to face with the law that Moses brought down off the mountain. Now those of you who are Sabbatarians, this is what you need to understand. Please don't shoot me. I've still got a couple of three good years left in me. Don't shoot me, okay? We keep the Sabbath as we understand it, if we're Sabbatarians, we, okay? But the Bible is very clear about the Sabbath issue. It's from even to even. Now, according to Old Testament scripture, where did they measure from even to even? Jerusalem, Jerusalem thank you. Not New York City, not Salt Lake City, certainly not San Francisco. Sabbath was reckoned and measured and timed from Jerusalem sundown to Jerusalem sundown. Now, I hate to say it, but those of you who are not in Jerusalem are in trouble. <laughs> There cannot be 24 Sabbaths. There's only one. So when this plan is finally worked out, when this plan finally bears the fruit, how will the Sabbath be measured? God is going to come here. God is going to bring his city, his throne. God is going to come here. He is going to plant himself here. And this is what it says. From one Sabbath to another and one new moon to another shall 90%, 10%, come to worship before me. Where is he sitting? Jerusalem. The Sabbath message is going to take on a wholeness and a fullness and a meaningfulness that not even Adventists or Jews have understood yet. They're not 24 Sabbaths. There's only one. We do the best we can in our human condition down here to let God and the world know we respect God's commands. But have we been promised, have we been told, have we been foretold that there is a, a fuller, larger, more meaningful message yet to come? Yes. When the Sabbath is preached more fully. The reason the 144,000 are pictured nowhere in the Bible, I mean clearly pictured, nowhere in the Bible except in the book of Revelation during the judgment hour message is because 100% of the Holy Spirit is going to be made available to human beings again. The last time that happened was with Jesus and the time happened before that in the garden with our first parents. The Spirit of God is going to be poured out again. How much of it? A hundred percent of it. Wow. Available to how many? 
ALL. It's not likely that all will be ready for it or endure it or whatever or whatever. That's between God and now. It's going to become absolutely necessary for, for you and me to receive more of the Spirit of God. Why? The Spirit of God represents light. The Spirit of evil represents what? Darkness. Is darkness coming? I mean, spirit darkness. Is spirit darkness coming? In a measure that none of us have ever seen or experienced. Thank you, Lord. Yet. When the enemy comes in with a flood of darkness, what has God promised to do? Raise up a standard. What is the message that every kindred tongue, nation, and people have to hear? That the kingdom of heaven is what? Is at hand. What does that mean? It means the temptations are going to be compounded, but it means the Spirit of God is going to be compounded. God is not going to leave us without... Now, when the latter rain is poured out, righteousness becomes possible for former sinners. We're all former sinners, all of us. What does righteousness mean? Right doing. I know you always do right. I'm not there yet. If I am going to be measured God's Spirit, God is measuring to me and you at this time the possibility, the potentiality of saying no. Our fathers, our pioneer fathers, believed with all their hearts and souls and being that the sanctuary message was closing shop. October 22 of 1844. It would have to be closing shop if Jesus were going to appear in the clouds of heaven and come here. He could no longer be ministering as a high priest up there. So there was an assumption on the part of our pioneer fathers. There was an assumption that heaven was about to close shop. That assumption persists in some quarters. We have to understand that people before our fathers believed that the world was ending in their day. And people before them believed the world was ending. And the disciples before them believed that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. There is nothing new under heaven. Nothing new. And especially with regards to it's all over and done with. You and I are alive at a time on this planet. How do I do this without offending anyone? Most human beings at the time of the flood did not recognize what was going on. They did not recognize that prophecy was being filled full before their eyes. They misread the signs. The end of misreading was the dumb people stayed off the boat and the dumb beasts got on. Right? Right. Now Jesus said, when this time comes, it's going to be exactly the same way. There are people, even in this room, who are watching what's going on. Here, there, all over this rock. And they think that 
the time of the end is near, it's coming. But the signs, the signs are filling full right before our very eyes. The natural signs, the earthquakes, the wars, the rumors of war, all of, all of those things, they're taking place. Let me speed it up for a moment. I don't want to get too far ahead, but uh, let's try. The disciples said to Jesus, uh, how can we know the time? That was the question. Very specific. How can we know the time of your coming and of the end? So Jesus said, there will be signs. He said, the day and the hour, I don't know, you don't know, but you can tell when it's yeah. near, even at the doors, right? So he said, uh, fire, flood, earthquakes, wars, rumors of more. Are we seeing all of these things? Yes. yes, we are. What's the problem then? Because we've always seen these things. The fact that the signs are multiplying is, is significant, but have there been wars before this time? Have there been earthquakes before this time? Have there been, have there been, have there been? Yes, of course. Is that what the skeptics will throw out when this time comes? Same thing they said about Noah and his boat. You've been doing this for 120 years, man. And you think I'm getting on board your boat? So there are signs, and the signs tell us that things are near even at the doors. But in the books of Daniel and Revelation, the signs become more specific, more direct. In Matthew, they're general. They're, these are specific, but not too specific. But when we get to Daniel and Revelation, uh, Daniel receives his very first vision. It's chapter 7 if you, you know, Daniel receives his very first vision. And what does he see? The four, one, two, three, four, the four winds of heaven blowing on the great sea. Winds, that's war and strife. And the great sea, people, multitudes, tongues. All over the world, wherever you cast your eye, the winds are blowing. Daniel's first vision opens with the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea and four great beasts, diverse one from the other, came up out of the sea. Uh, does he describe the second beast or third beast? Or does he describe the first beast? Come on. The first was like unto a lion that had crow's wings. Buzzard wings, dove wings. The first was like a lion with eagle's wings. And I watched until his eagle's wings were. And his lion's heart was. Now I love to quote famous people. America's not great anymore. We don't win wars anymore. Everything we do is wrong. 
But if you'll vote for me, we're going to make America right again. Now, how, how can you get again? That implies and suggests that your eagle's wings have been plucked and your lion's heart has been pulled out. How many people are watching all of this and hadn't got a clue? <laughs> I just suggested to you, no, I really said to you, that Daniel's first vision of the time of the end is already underway. Oh, no. This is not three and a half years. No, 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 no. Look. These are the measured days. Time of the end. This is the end of time. Make a distinction. Make a difference. I am saying in the plainest words, terms, that it is very possible that the time of the end is already upon us. Oh, we're going to enlarge on that a little bit, but... Uh, It is not only possible, I believe it is happening, that prophecy is fulfilling before our eyes and our seeing and hearing, and we still think it hasn't arrived yet. Prophecy is always about other people and other times. Something is happening. Something is going on. Now by and by, we're going to enlarge on this a little bit. And we're going to find out that there's... a possible 12-month period at the beginning of this process. 12 months, 12 months. I wanted to begin with a sanctuary discussion because the sanctuary discussion is prophetic and it's all about the time of the end. The time of the end and the end of time are the end of the sanctuary message or ending of. Mm. So I'm going to put this into your hands. Right now we're going to take just a few minutes to look before the moon recess. And we're going to enlarge upon this as we go through the afternoon. I have a lot of good friends. And they say things like, Charles, you're talking too much about money. You don't need to say so much about money. I hardly think you can say enough about money. Because if you and I are going to discuss the time of the end, what part is money going to play in it? It is the point. And who is going to use it? Only the good guys. <laughs> Thank you. Be sure you have one. Did you get one for yourself? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So the first thing I want to call your attention to is dollar signs. And the progression in the size of the dollar signs. Now that's not more money, more money, more money. It's, it's the significance of money and the crisis that is going to occur each time these dollar signs appear. The last great struggle is this one right here with the mark when it will be required of every kindred tongue, nation, and people 
that they receive a mark, a number, or a name. And if you don't, what is it that will be withheld from you? What? Right to use money. Thank you. It's not money that's being withheld from you. You can have money, but Ellen White says the time is coming when hoarded wealth will be worthless. You can have wealth, you can have money, but what is coming is a moment in earth time when you can't spend it. And what good is money if you can't spend it? Can you eat it? No, no. So I'm asking you to see with me the first dollar sign right here. First one. And uh, it says at just above that crisis. So what I put here on this little sheet, which you should have in hand, is that there is a crisis ahead. There's a crisis. And it's a dollar. It's, it's a money. It's a monetary crisis. That's what David Stockman is saying. Wait till we have the noon recess and we give you 38 minutes of, but that will come. So here we are with a crisis. Now, unless, I don't want to say supernatural, but unless super intervention takes place, all of the markets around the world could go belly up. How quickly could that happen in today's computer, computerized trading? How quickly? Okay. Now, it's not overnight, it's instantaneous. And because that possibility is so real, the markets have gone and set um, fences, barriers there, so that if the market starts dropping before it can drop more than whatever, they stop trading. Otherwise, it, 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 it's called flash. Okay? Flash crash. Now, we have an expression, it's a modern expression, kicking the can down the road. In other words, in 2007 and 2008, we had a crisis in the United States of America. If the United States of America had collapsed financially in 2007, 2008, who would we have taken down the drain with us? You're probably not aware of the measures that have been taken by the world and by other countries and other economies and whatever in the six, seven, eight years. You're probably not aware of what has been done so that if and when the United States of America goes we don't take everybody else down with us. We could talk about that for the rest of the day and tomorrow and another day and another day. We have the expression, kicking the can down the road. Now I submit to you, and I hope in the next few days or weeks, my words will come back to you. And you'll understand what the guy's trying to tell us. We're going to come to the point of a crisis. We've are, that's where we are right now. But it's not publicized. It's not, we don't talk it. But the financial leaders of the world, of the big banks of the world, of the governments of the world, they know where we are. We're at the precipice. We're at the point of. And unless somebody comes up with some way of kicking the can down the road, which is what we did in 2007 and 2008, then we're going down. And there's no end of predictors, modern day prophets, who are saying, before 2016 is over, we're going down. There's not a few. There are several worthy gurus who are saying, before 2016 is over, we're going down. Talking about the United States. Our markets are going to collapse. Does that mean 500 points? No. Does that mean 1,000 points? No. It means several thousand points in a day. All right? 
Now I'm not saying, I'm only saying what some are saying. I happen to believe prophetically that there's going to be a way in which the governments of the world are going to kick the can down the road a little while longer. Just buy us a little more grace. So let's see what happens. What is our immediate crisis? Our immediate crisis is a liquidity crisis. For a few years, the banks bombarded you, me, and all of us with every day in the mail another credit card offer. Just sign up, we'll open you a line of credit. Any of you around in those days? Today you go into the bank and they want 80% down. Not 20% down, they want 80% down. So someone I know said to my banker, if I had 80% down, I don't need to borrow nothing from you. <laughs> Are you listening? The crisis in practical terms is a liquidity crisis. We need more money in the system. We need money moving. And it's not just in the United States that this is the case. It's worldwide. So, we're here. Right here. If someone is going to kick the can down the road and buy us a little more time, There must be a flood of new money. What do we mean by new money? Come on. If I have a dollar bill that is green ink on white paper and it says Federal Reserve Note, what's it worth? What we think it's worth. What's yeah, it worth? yeah, it's an illusion. Yeah. yeah. What is its real worth? Its real value. Now maybe you're aware, maybe you're not, but in the last three weeks, China, Russia, Iran, and a whole bevy of countries outside of the United States have announced to the United States that we will no longer accept Federal Reserve notes for payment of anything. Now you, you, I'm, let's make sure you pull the cotton out of your ears, come on. Walmart buys all of its stuff from whom? Thank you. And how do they pay China? How do they pay China? With Federal Reserve notes. And China announced three weeks ago that it would no longer accept Federal Reserve notes. Fiat currency. Fiat. The only currency that the world is now going to accept is what? Asset-backed currency. In other words, you've got to have gold, silver, cotton, airplanes, ground. You've got to have something real and tangible to back up your currency. Now the United States has a bit of a problem right there. Tell me what the bit of a problem is. We don't have any gold anymore. We owe so much money that we don't have enough assets to pay. So what are we going to put behind our money? And the world accept it. Don't say credit. Yeah. What? No, they, they, they've already announced to us in the last three weeks that we're not, you print funny money and we're not taking it. We're over a barrel. We're over a barrel, but uh, what is, how are we going to kick this can down the road? How are we going to get a flood of 
new money. Now this is where you and I are about to see the new world order beast rise. We're about to see the beast for the first time. He's not going to be so ugly the first time. He's going to be flush with dough. Do you know what a shell game is? You know what a shell game is? You, you got something, you put it under three walnut shells and you pick the right one. All right? A shell game is you just take it and move it over to here and say, see, it's all here. Yeah, but it's not there. Yes, it is. See? So this is how the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the Bank for International Settlements, the BIS, this is how the beast system is going to meet this crisis. You listening? It is the United States of America that buys everybody else's stuff. <coughs> But everybody else has announced that they're not going to take our funny money anymore. So Walmart is either going to be out of business or somebody's got to ante up. So this is how we can play this game. Are you listening? You've got money. You're printing some new money. You have oil. You have gold. You have whatever to back up your money. So what we're going to do is do business with you and take some of your money and deposit it in our banks. Because your money is not worthless. So if we take some of your money and put it in our banks, we are adding assets to our money. We're, we're devising asset-backed currency. So here's another country and they've got assets to back up their currency. So let's get some of theirs. Let's bargain with them. Let's get some of theirs and put it in our banks. And let's get some of this other one over here and let's put it in our banks. That's the way we're going to do this. And then when the button is pushed, when the crisis is full blown, ready to... and we're, we're virtually there, but when the crisis is ready what we do is announce to the world that we have solved America's problem. And what have we done? We have new assets to back our money. And in order to demonstrate that, we're going to print all new U.S. currency. Five minutes. Please listen. In 1898, a little lady by the name of Ellen White was in Australia at the time and letters were coming across the Pacific. Very troubling letters were coming because something was happening over here stateside that troubled her so much that finally she sat down and wrote a testimony. You can find it in Testimonies to Ministers. She wrote a testimony. She wrote letters to the leadership of the church, the denomination. And she says, things are out of sorts here. Things are not right here. There's dangerous, this is dangerous business. And she says, from the light given me, there's coming a change in the circulating currency. Did you hear that? There will be a change in the circulating currency. And I was shown that it was a device of Satan for the last days. Was 1898 the last days? Nah, no. Did she think Jesus was coming in her day? Did they think? Yes, yes, yes. 
So what she's writing about and what she's describing belongs at the end. There will be a change in the circulating currency. It is not of the devising of God, the changing of the circulating currency. And what will it affect? It will create hardship, especially for the poor. Got any poor people marching around saying, So you and I are about to experience a change in the circulating currency. And the circulating currency that is coming has to be asset backed. And so all kinds of wonderful pronouncements will be made so that you are not disturbed. So that the public does not rush to the banks in fear of losing what they have or whatever or whatever. Wonderful things shall be spoken. Now what is going to be pictured was pictured as well by the same little lady and by New Testament prophets. Something is going to happen that is going to cause the time to look rosy. So I'm going to quote verbatim. When all are looking forward to many years of worldly prosperity, suddenly, as the light flashes from the heavens, will come the end. Let's, let's, let's picture that. Will come the end of their bright visions and delusive hopes. Now the New Testament says, and when they shall all say, when they shall say, peace and what? Yeah, it, it says safety in the King James, but the word in the Greek is prosperity. When they shall say peace and prosperity, what happens? Sudden destruction. Sudden failure, sudden destruction. Does Ellen White get to that point? Yes. Money will soon depreciate in value very suddenly when the reality of eternal scenes opens to the senses of man. All We have a roadmap, folk. We have... Statement after statement after statement, our problem is we don't know where they belong. The purpose of this and the purpose of this day is to show you where these statements belong. And the reason the dollar signs are there is because money is going to be a larger, a greater, and a more this. And we're going to close. The beast rises, the beast receives a deadly wound. It actually says in the Greek right there, a wound that made him appear to be slain unto death. It looks like a mortal wound. It looks as though we kicked the can down the road, but it didn't last very long. We'll get here. It's going to be a crisis. And there's going to be a crisis. And we go from the beast to the image to the beast. The deadly wound Revelation 13, when we get to it, is I saw a beast rising out of the sea. Mouth of a lion. Feet of a bear. The body of the leopard. That's the lion, the bear, and the leopard. Those are mortal enemies in the real world. But when we get here, some crisis, some crisis so deep, so intense, so terrible, you get the lion, the bear, and the leopard to work together. So John said, I saw the beast and his deadly wound was healed. And only the folks in Texas followed him. Is that what it says? How much of the world? All 
all the world wandered and wondered after the beast. Wait till we get into this in the afternoon. We talked sanctuary. Money is going to become an issue, but the issue behind the issue is the one that Jesus said has to go to every kindred, tongue, nation, and people. And what is the message? That heaven is about to close shop. Amen. And scarcely are the Adventists preaching that. Heaven is soon to close shop. What will the pronouncement be? He that is righteous, let him be. Righteous. What's the word? Still. And he that is filthy, let him be. Filthy. And once that pronouncement is made, there is no changing of the record, no changing of the heart, no changing of the mind, no changing of... Destiny is sealed. Father in heaven, these are such important topics. Time is moving so fast, so quickly, and in the wrong direction. But with the Word of God, we are moving in the right direction. We want this present even evil world to pass away and we want Jesus to come. We want the kingdom of heaven to come. And what can we mere human beings do to hasten that day and that hour? I thank you for these people. I thank you for their witness in the past. And I thank you for the promise to pour out your spirit on them and all of us and all of the people on this rock so that we can bear a greater witness. We have a mission. We have a calling. We have a purpose. And I ask you to wake us up to these truths, this reality. I thank you for giving us an hour to be refreshed and blessing us. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.